we fire up this hearing. Um, and for the couple members, and, and I appreciate it, I know you, um, the minority member was actually at a really important hearing. And Thank you for coming. We were, we were getting worried without you, though. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and before we actually really get going, I want a motion for unanimous consent that you allow me to buy a real coffee maker for the committee. <laughs> oh. No, seriously, they have a 1980s Mr. Coffee back there. Yeah, it is small business. Okay. Um, good morning. I want to welcome everyone to our subcommittee um, and Ranking Member Clark. Um, I, I look forward to this. There's, I'm learning lots of things. Um, I had the opportunity to read everyone's testimony last night. And um, today's hearing, we're going to focus on the Regulatory Flexibility Act, um, analyze the impacts of these regulations and the mechanics and the advocacy um, uh, you do, you know, for small business. Um, you know, once again, in, in much of the reading last night, there was the constant theme of the danger of a regulation that may be one size fits all and yet how radically different the sizes of our business organizations are across our country. Um, there is one thing I'm going to personally sort of keep as a theme and look for is uh, I found in much of this binder a lack of sort of data. Here's the flow. Here's how we actually make the decision. Um, uh, Dr. Sargent, as you give us your testimony and then we engage in some of the conversation, uh, my understanding is you may have a few thousand rule sets that are ultimately floating across your desk. How do you triage that? How do you make a decision that these are the 40 or 50 that are most impactful? And, you know, uh, the reality, you're not going to catch everything, but I'm sort of curious, your met just methodology, and also suggestions from you and the rest of the witnesses on how we can make the process work even better. Remember, this is a law that's been around since the late Carter administration. Um, you know, in that time set, the world has changed a lot. What do we do to continue to make this work um, for our small businesses out there? And um, ranking member, let me uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you for your indulgence this morning. Uh, when you're in the minority, you wear multiple caps. I happen to also be ranking member on uh, Homeland Security, and we had a briefing this morning. But I'm one, it's wonderful to be here and to have you here, Dr. Sargent, to uh, give us your perspective. Um, I'd like to thank you for holding today's uh, important hearing. Our nation's regulatory structure is absolutely vital in protecting the public. The fact is, without regulations, our air would be less pure, our water unsafe to drink, and employees would potentially be subject to unsafe and hazardous working conditions. That said, most evidence points to a disproportional impact on small businesses with regards to regulatory compliance. Our small businesses and entrepreneurs simply do not have the economies of scale to mitigate the costs that large corporations do in this regard. With that in mind, Congress passed the Regulatory Flexibility Act to ensure that the concerns of small firms were taken into account during the regulatory process. Past concerns regarding agencies' failure to initiate a regulatory flexibility analysis of a pending rule makes monitoring performance in this area critical. Agencies have certified that a proposed rule would not have a significant impact on small businesses when the exact opposite becomes evident after the fact. In some cases, analysis by the agencies have been lacking altogether, thus limiting the effectiveness of the law and shortchanging America's entrepreneurs. For this act to maintain its legitimacy, it is vital that its processes and requirements be used appropriately to make regulations more targeted efficient and effective. For small businesses, regulation can be a two-sided coin. While no entrepreneur wants to pay more or comply with unnecessary rules, effective regulation can prevent unfair practices that would benefit large companies at the expense of our small business community, causing harm to the public interest. In that regard, our goal should not be the short-sighted removal of all regulations, but rather make the process smarter, fairer, and one that protects the, good, the public good while minimizing the impact on our nation's small businesses. Again, 
I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you. All right, um, Doctor, I know you've testified before, but also for our future witnesses. Um, mechanics are fairly simple. You know, five minutes, green light, start, yellow light, go faster, red light. Um, we'll, you know, uh, in idiosyncrasy, I will have, um, and this will be with, for everyone, I'm going to let you finish at least your thought. And with that, um, Dr. Sargent, um, let me do a quick introduction for you. Um, Dr. Wilson Sargent was appointed by President Obama and confirmed by the United States Senate as the sixth chief counsel advocate for the United States Small Business Administration. The chief counsel for advocacy is charged with monitoring agency compliance with the Regulatory Flexibility Act and is required to annually report to Congress on his findings. Welcome. Your five minutes begins. Chairman Swikert, Ranking Member Clark, and members of the subcommittee, I am Dr. Winslow, Sergeant Chief Counsel for Advocacy. Thank you for the invitation to appear before you today to discuss the important issue of agency compliance with the Regulatory Flexibility Act, or RFA. Congress created the Office of Advocacy in 1976 to be a voice for small business within the federal government. Advocacy's mission is to advance the views, concerns, and interests of small business before Congress, the White House, federal agencies, federal courts, and policymakers. We work with federal agencies in the rulemaking process to implement the requirements of the RFA. Under the RFA, agencies must consider the effects of their proposed rules on small businesses. When an agency finds that a proposed rule may have a significant economic impact on a substantial number of small entities, the agency must consider significant alternatives that would minimize the burden on small entities while still achieving the original goal of the regulation. Advocacy works with federal agencies in a number of ways to improve their, their RFA compliance and to ensure the concerns of small businesses are considered during the rulemaking process. Much of advocacy's work with agencies is at the confidential pre-proposal stage, when agencies are working through the regulatory development process. Advocacy continues to expand its stakeholder outreach by hearing directly from small firms and their representatives. This also gives agency rule writers a chance to hear particular small business concerns. In total, we have convened 84 roundtables since I became Chief Counsel. Advocacy sends public comment letters that explain small business concerns about certain regulations and other proposals to agencies when warranted. As Chief Counsel, I have signed more than 90 public comment letters on a variety of topics. Three agencies are required to conduct a Sabrifa panel to gather comments from small entity representative on a, on a proposed regulation when it may have a significant economic impact on small businesses. They are EPA, OSHA, and now the CFPB. These panels include representative from the rulemaking agency, OIRA, and advocacy. In the last two years, we have participated in a dozen Zabrifa panels, including the first three panels ever by the CFPB. Having generally explained how the Office of Advocacy works with agencies, I am pleased to report that agencies continue to improve their compliance with the RFA in fiscal year 2012. A detailed analysis of this compliance can be found in advocacy's report on the Regulatory Flexibility Act, FY 2012, which I, which I delivered to Congress last month. I ask that a copy of this report be submitted in its entirety in, into the record. Agency compliance with the RFA pays real dividends to America's small businesses. In FY 2012, Advocacy's RFA work saved small businesses $2.4 billion in first-year regulatory costs and another $1.2 billion in, annual, in, in annually re recurring costs. The RFA and bipartisan efforts to enhance it have made this critical small business law more effective in reducing the regulatory burdens on small entities when regulations are still in the development stage. The willingness of agencies to attend the roundtables at advocacy and hear directly from, from small businesses 
has been a welcome development re resulting in improved agency compliance with the RFA. We have learned through our more than 30 years of experience with the RFA that regulations are more effective when small firms are part of the rulemaking process. The result of enhanced agency cooperation with advocacy and improved agency compliance with the RFA benefits small businesses, the regulatory environment, and the overall economy. Finally, I was invited here to testify on agency compliance with the RFA. I understand testimony in the second panel contained numerous misrepresentations of my office. I would like to reserve the right to respond in detail in the record to the, these in inaccurate allegations. Thank you again for the, opportun the, the opportunity to testify on the important work of the Office of Advocacy does on behalf of small business. I would be happy to take any questions you might have. Uh, thank you, Doctor. And um, do understand, when we finish up the hearing, we, I believe the, these committees have, what, five days for any additional written testimony. So if you hear something that you think needs more detail and explanation, please give it to us. Um, Doctor, uh, you and I started a conversation as we were passing in, and, and first was more love methodology of how you do your job. Um, it's 2013. There's literally a few thousand rule sets out there in some type of promulgation. How do you decide what you're going to focus on? Well, Chairman Swikert, there are a number of ways that the Office of Advocacy is engaged in, in, in making sure that the rules that are, that are at the pre-proposal stage and also those that are being proposed will, will um, that, that we are in, in, in touch um, to make sure that we're on top of all the right issues. Um, we have a number of regional advocates who are out in the field who, have, who are in touch with small businesses. Who we hear their concerns. But under the RFA, when a rule will have a significant economic impact on a substantial number of small entities, now that's the determination by an agency themselves, not, not the Office of Advocacy. They must contact us to let us know that this rule is coming and they believe it's going to have a significant economic impact. So that's one way that they have to notify us that this rule is coming. We also have a number of attorneys in the office that's, that work directly with their counterparts at the agency. So they tell us what rules are coming. There's a regulatory agenda that is published. So we kind of see at, that's one, one, one input that we have as a kind of as a roadmap of what's coming down the pike. And so there are many ways that we're in, in touch. In, in your time in doing this, um, and so, so you have a, a methodology where the agencies are telling you this is going to cost a certain amount and you're trying to track. Have you had the experience where um, the feedback you're getting from outside advocacy groups mm -hmm. are telling you dramatically different um, dollars um, burden compared to what you're actually being told from the agency? And how, do you, and how do you split that sort of arbitrage? How do you make that decision? How do you well, triage that? Well, well, what we do is uh, it, it, it's important for us to have first um, firsthand contact with those who are going to who are going to be in, who are going to be impacted by these rules. And so we so when a rule is proposed, we'll reach out. Um, there are many ways that we'll reach out to trade association to to actually small businesses themselves to gauge from them how this rule will impact their business. And from that, we may um, have a roundtable where we will invite the agency themselves to come and, and to share with us and, and, and with small business owners how this rule, why this rule is necessary and how it will impact them. Will you, will you often run into the experience where you're getting, um, where the vision between sort of the small businesses or small business advocacy groups and what the agency is a chasm? Well, th that's why I have written more than 90 common letters in terms of that there's, that there are times where um, what we're hearing from small business owners in terms of what the impact of those rules will be and what we're hearing from those who are, are actually writing the rules, um, there is a disconnect. Many, um, in, our, in our report, um, one of the um, one of the main reasons we may write a comment letter is that um, we believe that there may be a certification of that this rule will not have a significant economic impact, but what we're hearing or um, that it will, and so that's where the disconnect will be, and so that's the feedback that we'll give to the rule writers. Do, do you, Doctor, do you believe your feedback is being respected by many of those regulatory agencies? Well, we 
we have a generally a good work relationship with, with, with agencies. They tend to do a good job. Um, under Executive Order 13272, that was actually signed by George W. Bush, um, that agencies, they're, they're required to, um, they're, they're required to, to, to respond to what we write. And so when we, um, so that when we go on writing by saying, well, we believe this rule will have this effect, they have to come back and, and to state, you know, okay. you know, just give some feedback. Well, uh, only two other real, uh, well, two others. One may not be as quick as the other. Um, you, you've been uh, working with the CFPB. Yes. Um, you know, the, the wide swath of regulatory authority um, from, you know, the, the community lender to the community bank to, you know, uh, first, how has that relationship been for you, your organization? Do you feel you're getting input? But also, um, be seeing how they're a new regulatory organization, do you see the discipline being built for them to actually take your feedback and understand and listen? Um, we have a good relationship with CFPB. And, and I guess that one of the benefits of a new agency is that we can help to train them. And so what we did when the agency was formed under Dodd-Frank, and, and as you know, under Dodd-Frank, they're now one of the three covered agencies that must, um, that must um, conduct panels. And so what we've done, so what we did, ev um, even before they started to write rules, we would invite um, you know, folks from CFPB to come over to the Office of Advocacy so we can walk them through what is the RFA, how to conduct a panel, what are some of the best practices? And so far, there's been three panels so far. And we work with them on who they should invite. Of course, it's up to the agency themselves in terms of who will be invited to the panel. But we do have a say as one of three um, heads that will be part of the panel. And so out of the three panels, um, you know, the feedback that I've gotten so far um, from from small business, they are, you know, they're pleased that their input has been taken seriously. this year sort of becomes a universal question I'd like to ask. Um, and, and it may be from s your, the statutes you operate under or the, the rule sets you've built for yourselves. Um, what works, what doesn't work? What, if you could walk in right now and say, I wish this was changed in my statute that would make us more effective, or um, what would you change? Well, well, the RFA has been around for more than 30 years. and, and um, we feel that it has worked well, but of course there are always ways that one could tweak it to to act to make it more effective. And so, under my legislative priorities, I have submitted three recommendations to strengthen the RFA. One is dealing with the Sabrifa panel process. What we see in under 609B is that when I'm notified that a panel will take place, there's there's a 15-day gap that a panel can actually start. What we're saying that for that for the SIRs or for those who are going to be part of the panel, they need to have the data so they can contribute. It 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 doesn't make sense to have a panel, and then those who are at the table they're not able to see what the data see see why this rule is being crafted. So we believe that by having a gap of say maybe 60 days, then the agency will have more time to make sure that the data gets out to those who will be on the panel. So that's one. Two. Under the RFA Section 610, every year um, agencies are required to to look at rules that are 10 years look at rules that are 10 years old to see whether or not those rules are needed. There's not a systematic process in terms of how each agency goes through that. One agency could say, "Well, we looked at the rule; it looks good," and then. And, and so we believe that, and you, and you wrote about this yes. in the past, because weren't you sort of writing also that you, you were concerned that how many agencies may or may not really be doing it? Yes, and so there should be a systematic process. So under six ten, so we believe that one should have a systematic process to look at the rules that are more than ten years old, and to see whether or not those rules are needed, but also look at see what the cost benefit because a rule goes into effect because we're trying to uh, achieve some regulatory. Um, action. Let's see how what has taken place and see whether or not that rule is needed. 
So that's so that's two. Third, um, the RFA deals with direct impact on small business. But we also know that there's what we call the near foreseeable indirect effects. There are those that might be infected with products and services. And so one may say, well, it's not a direct effect, but we can see that what we call the circle, you know, that one circle out, that there is an effect. And so we want agencies, and so when we train agencies in terms of how to comply with the RFA, we also tell them, yes, the language says you have to consider the direct effect on small entities, but also we want you to also look at what, what is the near foreseeable indirect effect as, as well. All right. Thank you, Doctor. Ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and let me welcome Dr. Sargent to the subcommittee today once again. And I would like to take a moment just to express my appreciation to you and your staff and your New York Regional Advocate, Terry Colson, for your responsiveness to inquiries from my office in the past. And I look forward to continuing uh, that working relationship over the course of the 113th Congress. Um, just as a follow-up to your, your last response uh, to our chairman, some say the biggest loophole in the RFA is the fact that it doesn't require agencies to analyze indirect impacts. Legislation has been approved by this committee in the last two Congresses that would have required agencies to consider foreseeable indirect impact of regulations on small firms. Would you be supportive of such a change to the RFA and yeah. why? Yes, I would be supportive. And, and we actually train under, un, under Executive Order 13272. We are charged to train agencies on how to comply with the RFA. And in our training, we tell them, yes, the RFA states, you know, you have to consider the, the direct effect, but we also have asked them to consider also what you call the foreseeable, because we recognize that there is an impact. And um, when we talk with small business owners themselves, they see that their products, their services have been impacted by, the, by a particular regulation. And so I would be supportive of making sure that, that agencies um, take into account what we call the foreseeable. I, I, I also know that agencies that when you say, because we can measure what the direct <coughs> impact is, once you say indirect effects, then that's, that we, that's what I call this broad loop. So that's why we focus on what's called the near foreseeable. It's close it, because, you know, at some point everything could be tied in. And, and so I, I would be supportive and, and, I, and I would welcome the opportunity to work with you on how we can define what is the near foreseeable indirect effects. Wonderful. And I think uh, our chairman uh, uh, is uh, interested in, in looking at how uh, we, we can get that done. Um, my second question is twofold. Uh, could you first give us a broader picture of your progress in ensuring that agencies are fully complying with the RFA? And then secondly, are we requesting further compliance, in requesting uh, further compliance, can you explain to us the effect of sequester that the sequester will have on the Office of Advocacy's ability to carry out its mission with regards to the regulatory burden on small businesses. Okay. Each year we put out a report on agency compliant with the RFA, and I have submitted for the record which agencies, you know, those, most agencies do a good job, but some, you know, we continue to work with them, and, um, and we're pleased that the President, under Executive Order 13563, have mandated that agencies you know, work with, um, make sure that rules that are coming down the pike that they, um, yes, they can promote health and safety, but also take into account the impact of those rules on small business. And so we have support from the administration, and so we work with agencies to make sure that they understand the RFA, and we train them. We uh, a and so and and so we also have roundtables as well. Roundtables that are open to the public. We invite those officials from the agency so they can hear directly from small businesses. And so that's one way that we work with agencies on how that they can comply. With regard to the sequester, yes, we have been significantly impacted um, by the sequester. Um, we've uh, been hit uh, roughly about 5.2 percent in terms of our budget, and so we're going to lose about $460,000. And although we're not going to lose people, or I don't have to furlough people. We are going to take a big hit to our to our research budget. 
this office is founded on two goals. It's the research and the regulatory mandate. We believe that good research leads to sound regulation, but you have to have the research. So by not having that, those funding, we're going to lose roughly six to seven research reports that we would normally put out. And so that's the concern I have, because we believe that good data leads to sound regulation. And just then finally, uh, one of the ongoing concerns with the RFA, RFA excuse me, has been the ability of agencies to continually forego the requirement in Section 610 that requires periodic review of the rules. How is President Obama's Executive Order uh, 13563, which requires retrospective agency review of regulations, meshing with the requirement of this section? Well. We were pleased that Executive Order 13563 came out because what it did is that it, it, it reminded agencies that um, this is a requirement and it, and it dovetailed very nicely with 610. And so we've been working with OIRA, we've been working with agencies, we've um, shared with agencies rules that are on the books right now that we've heard from small businesses that are problematic or th they have concerns. And so um, we continue to work with agencies. We were pleased that Executive Orders um, 13579 not only um, dealt with those that are part of the executive branch, but also the independent agencies, because the independent agencies sometimes feel that they don't have to comply with the RFA, and so that was a recommendation. We were pleased that 135609 reminded, 135610 reminded agencies, you must comply with, with retrospective review. And, and also there's been great outreach to us to work with agencies on how to comply. And so we're seeing more progress. We're seeing more agencies asking us to help them train, to train them as well. And so we've been very busy these past couple of days. We've trained more than 100, 100 staffers per year now on how to comply with the RFA. So I do believe that there is a desire to look at rules that are on the books, and, and, and so that's been working well. Very well. Thank you so much, Dr. Sergeant. Thank and I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member. And my friend from Michigan, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, as I traveled throughout my district in Michigan, business leaders tell me the same thing over and over again. It's too hard to start or expand my small business because they can barely understand how to comply with the latest regulations that have come out of Washington. And they're right. Over the last four years, the number of business regulations has skyrocketed, and the result has been the worst economic recovery in nearly a century. We've had such a weak economic growth that I'm not even sure we can call it a recovery. The millions of people still out of work sure haven't recovered. I once believed that this was a nation of laws. Instead, I find this is not a nation of laws, rather a nation of regulations, a regulation, if you will. My question, uh, Dr. Sargent, is, well, uh, I had a few businessmen tell me that um, once they are complying or working with a regulatory agency, after they've worked six months or a year, the executive changes. There's transfers and that kind of thing. And then the new person that comes in to replace the old executive uh, has a whole set or new set of regulations they want these businesses to adhere to. Do you see this as a problem? And if so, how would we correct that? Well, um, what we try to do is to, is to work with agencies to make sure that they understand um, how a particular rule um, will impact small businesses. But we also work with, with agencies because we can't, we don't block rules or make rules less effective, but we, we work with agencies so, so that they achieve their regulatory goal, but also make, work with agencies in terms of compliance. Because what we hear many times is that small businesses, they want to comply, but sometimes they don't know how. And so there is a provision within the RFA that when you put forth a rule, that you should also put forth a document on how to comply with the rule. And so with our regional advocates who are out in the field, we work directly with small businesses. We also recognize that rules, 
yes, we focus at the federal level, but also there's rules at the local and state level. And as a small business owner, as someone who's run a small business, I didn't, I didn't look at a rule, okay, this is, this is a federal rule, this is a state, this is a local rule. I looked at it as a rule, and how am I going to comply? And so that's why we work with states on how to enact a state version of the RFA. My predecessor worked hard on how to make sure that there's a process that when rules are put forth, even at the state level, that, that there's feedback from small entities, but also there's a way to comply. And, and, once that, and, and, and once that is a process, we hope that as people change, that that process is clear, transparent, and predictable. So, so what does a business do if, for instance, and I don't really think you answered my question. Yeah. Okay. What, um, a business uh, is, trying, is working with uh, a branch of you know, a regulatory agency, mm -hmm. and the executive comes in and says, I want to focus on these regulations. Mm -hmm. And then six months or a year later, another person uh, replaces that person at the regulatory agency and comes up with a whole new agenda. And so, and sometimes, according to my um, small businesses that I've talked to at my small business yeah. roundtables in my community, in my district, so that, well, they have a whole set, set of different rules. And it's kind of like they have to drop what they're doing and trying to comply with one set mm -hmm. to go in with a different set. Do you understand? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, well, that's part of the regulatory agenda because each year, um, twice a year, um, agencies are required under the RFA to put forth what rules that they're going to work on. And if the rule will have a significant economic impact on a substantial number of small entities, that's the language, they have to contact us. They, they are, are required to put what's called a, a what's called an IRFA. Um, that's, part of, um, that's part of the RFA. They need to do the analysis to say how this rule will impact <laughs> small entities. And so there's a process that must be, that must be followed, and it's through the RFA. And that's where we get to comment. We work with small ag we work with agencies to make sure that sm small entities will have a say within the process. So the RFA works when agencies work with us, and we reach out to agencies to bring in small entities so they can have a say. Thank you very much, Doctor. I yield back my time. Thank you, and to my good friend from New Hampshire, uh, Ms. Kessler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Clark uh, and Chairman Schweikert. I did enjoy participating with you in the panel on uh, small business leaders operating online and proud of the folks from New Hampshire that were doing that good work. I'm new to this subcommittee, and I'm excited to join with my colleagues from both parties to conduct oversight over the executive branch and work with you to provide relief to overregulated small businesses. I think we all recognize that the government alone does not create jobs, but that it's the responsibility of government to foster the conditions for small businesses to grow, to hire, and to succeed. In my state of New Hampshire, 90 percent of new jobs come from small businesses. But unfortunately, as we all know, poorly thought out regulations can all too often have the opposite impact, creating uncertainty and stifling economic growth. So in today's hyperpartisan political climate, I'm hopeful, and it sounds as though the committee does have measures that we can all agree on to alleviate the burden and protect the public with important regulations. Um, so I'm just going to ask some very basic questions. In your experience, Dr. Sargent, what are an example of some of the successes and accomplishments in your accomplishments in your office that you're most proud of that might give us an example of how your office provides um, assistance in the process in, in a successful example. Well, thank you for your support of the office. There, there are a number of ways that we engage small business. And, uh, and, and if I was to look back at some of the successes we've had, um, and with regard to regulation, it, it may take a little while for the process to be complete. But we can say that um, through the RFA and, and, and the work we've done, we've had we, we've had a fair amount of success. One that I can point out to was something called the 3 percent withholding um, that was actually passed in 2005. This was a rule that said that on all federal contracts, 3 percent would be withheld until the IRS checked to make sure that, the tax, that taxes were paid by, small, by 
by small businesses. Now, we believe that you have to pay your taxes. Mm -hmm. But when you work with the federal government, when you think of 3%, because these contracts, there's not a huge amount of margin. And so this 3% was taken off the top, and there was no process of how long this was, would take for the IRS to do their job. This would put a lot of small entities, small businesses, actually in debt, or they would have to turn down the contract. And so we were pleased by working with small entities that this was, this was, this was repealed by Congress in 2012. And so that's one. We, we also can cite also what we call uh, the IRS home office deduction. We were pleased, um, and not to pick on the IRS, but um, we we're pleased that the home office deduction, 52% of all small businesses are home-based businesses. And, and, what we, and, and it wasn't a clear process of how you took, took into account that home office deduction. We we're pleased that the IRS just recently made it clear, made it transparent, such that you can, you can um, up to $1,500, you can deduct. And we've heard from home-based businesses. We've heard from small businesses. Um, this is a huge win because um, we know that more and more people are starting companies um, from home, and and they're not just staying at home, but they'll grow. And so those are just just two of many examples that we've had so far. And we're pleased that our process, you know, that the way that we work with federal agencies, that there's been a successful outcome. Right. Good. Well, thank you. Um, now, part of my district is very rural, and uh, so rural, in fact, that we are still on dial-up in, in this uh, day and age. So you can imagine the burden on small business. As I say, you know, yeah. you've got a customer on the line, and then you have to say, oh, let me put you on hold while I go <laughs> look on the Internet um, on another phone line. So I'm just curious if you have experience with your committee, I mean, with your agency, about the unique burdens of, on small businesses in rural communities, and particularly with regard to compliance over the Internet or paperwork reduction where compliance involves Internet access. Yes, we've, um, we've heard of concerns, and we know firsthand and I know firsthand, because I've lived in, in rural communities, that it's important to have access to the web. And so we put out a study. We, we were um, charged by Congress to do what's called a broadband study a couple of years ago. A and in this study, it, it, it showed that, um, that those in, in, in rural areas paid more, for actually paid more money for less service for broadband. And this really complicates because we all don't choose to live in cities, but also this also adds to what we call brain drain, where people who would like to live in, you know, if you want to live next to a lake or live where you want to live and also run a business, you also must be able to tap into broadband. And so we are concerned, and so we've shared this report with the FCC and those who oversee broadband to let them know that our nation, those who want to live in communities must be able to get access to affordable and accessible broadband because it helps our economic environment, but it also will cut down all, all this congestion. There are, a number of, there are a number of benefits, and so, yes, we are concerned that those who live in rural communities have to pay more for less. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kessler. Um, I'm, I just have a couple others, and, and, uh, and as we were sort of sharing before, I have sort of a personal fixation in my couple years around here of how much sort of decision making we do in this body on sort of folklore mm -hmm. and not data and facts. And so uh, first, walk me through a little bit of your process just so I'm sort of understanding the disciplines and the mechanics within the office. Um, okay, a few thousand rule sets. Uh, in promulgation of some sort. And somehow, you, as you shared with me earlier, um, the agencies have said we, they believe that this costs this, this costs this. You have trade associations that may have a very different view, but you choose 50 of them. Yes. Okay, now those are you know, within your process. Do you mechanically start to do a cost benefit? I mean, how, how, what's the next step you do internally to analyze those and decide, yes. you know, is this something? You know, you you need to be fairly bold about and write about. What do you do? Yes, 
What we do, Chairman, is um, we will reach out to small businesses to sh ask them, this is a rule that's being proposed. How will this impact you? So we are pleased that we have regional advocates around the country because the majority of businesses are outside of Washington, D.C. So we must, we must hear what's going on. And we also know that it's not a one-size-fits-all, but it's not a one-size, one region fits all. What, what mm -hmm. may happen in the Northeast may be different than what happens in the Southwest. And so once we hear um, from small entities what, you know, how this rule will impact them, we'll actually have a roundtable. We'll bring the official from the agencies. We'll bring those who have different points of view to share in terms of how this rule will impact. And also, we ask the agencies to share the data, if they have it, on, on why they came up with this number. And then we'll ask those who are at the table, share what you have. Share with the agency officials your number. Okay, Dr. Sergeant, that's almost to the point. So, okay, so they, you're getting sort of a presentation of how they did yes. their cost benefit? Yes, yes. Do you have an internal mechanism to vet that? Well, I mean, do, do you have a statistician sitting in the back who's built the brilliant spreadsheet and is dicing things up? I mean, I'm just sort of curious how you get there. Well, well, well what we do is that we work with small entities themselves and, and, their, and to try to get some numbers from them. We do have our own research but it may, but and sometimes there's a nice fit, but sometimes it's just more of a global fit. How this will impact small business? So we ask the agencies themselves. It's up to the agency to share what they have in terms of data, but also we will reach out um, with to trade associations for them to share what they have, and so that's how we're able to. Um, we hope to come okay. together. So, so in some ways, yeah. you you become sort of an aggregator of information from the agency, trade associations, individuals who believe they're going to be affected. Yes, because we have a research budget, but for us to do that research in such a short manner um, with the rules, um, it, it would be very, very difficult it, you know, for us to do it within a timely manner. So it's, it's important for us. We take our, our direction from small business, so we want to hear you from them. You said something before about your 15-day window and wishing you had 60 well, that's for the Sabrifa panel process. Okay, so that's that's yeah. the next tier. Yeah. Once once I've been notified, then they have they could start a panel within 15 days, and and we believe and I believe that you should give more time to to the agencies, but also to the representative who will serve on those panels, so they can digest the data. Okay, and in, so they can come prepared to talk. And so, in, in your internal flow, okay. So the next step yeah. after you've done your aggregation of of sort of cost benefit. Use a couple of econometrics uh, or economists on staff. Yes, yes. That are doing yes. some dicing there of what they believe the economic impact is, not necessarily the cost benefit. Yes, well, that's part of it, yes. That's, yes. And, and do, do they use a particular mechanics or methodology or approach? Well, it's, um, you typically use cost benefit analysis. You work with the agencies themselves to say, well, how did you, who did you talk to? Um, how were you able to quantify this number? And, and we can understand costs. Sometimes benefits are hard to, hard to quantify. And so we're charged under the RFA to only look at costs. So that's where we focus on and how this rule will impact cost-wise. And so that's where we share back with the agency and, and say, well, we believe that you've certified this rule or you've underestimated the cost because we've spoken to these businesses. Okay around the country. You do that as part of your sort of economic side yeah. and models. Yeah. Um, last, Dr. Sergeant, you, before you actually sort of spoke of the um, s concentric rings, you know, the one step out, yeah. where it may not only affect the small business, mm -hmm. but may actually affect the small business's supplier, yeah. I guess is how you were ultimately trying to, and trying to understand that sort of, um, you know, uh, outward effect. Um, uh, share with me, where would you find that? How, how do you grab that and pull that into your analysis? Well, well, what we try to do um, when we train agency officials under the RFA, we talk about what we call the foreseeable economic impact or the indirect impact. And so if, if this rule is going to impact, say, like you said, like the suppliers, a product or a service, what we want them to do is to try to capture that because that's not, you know, as, as you mentioned, with regard to the ring, that's a that's tightly coupled ring. That's close. That's not a huge loop. And so what we do is we give them some recommendations on products or services or 
work environment, how this rule will impact. And so that's the type of feedback, that's the type of training that we give to agency officials. Um, Doctor, I appreciate your, your time with us. Um, if you ever find yourself on the Hill and A, you want actually good coffee, come to my office. <laughs> okay. And this for everyone, we have a frou-frou cappuccino machine. <laughs> Pay for it personally. Um, and, and second of all, if, if you ever happen to be on the Hill, I, I'd love to sort of flow chart your okay. mechanics. J just um, p part of this is, is trying to understand, because you know, in, my, in my vision of the world, there's a difference between um, doing a cost-benefit analysis and then a, 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 an econometrics or yeah. economic analysis, yeah. you know, um, you know, because over here you sometimes find the law of unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. This is sort of the, you know, the, the cost implementation compared to, you know, alternatives. Because I, I know you don't get to yeah. override a rule. Yeah. But um, sometimes you and I have seen occasions where if we, if, if the agency was writing the rule in this direction, it would have be more impactful in society than the approach they're taking, you know. So, and, and I don't know if you, you get listened to in that fashion. So, well, I would welcome the opportunity to have my team come over and go through the process because we train more than a hundred officials each year. M many uh, staff members from the Hill will come to our training session, so we could walk you through and would. Welcome I'd, such a dialogue. I, I genuinely would like to learn more yeah. about what you do okay. and how we can, you know, you, you know, the impact on small business. That's where we need to find our, you know, much of our job Absolutely. creation. So, yeah. thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, um, Doctor. I want to thank you for your testimony, and um, you're excused. And now we're going to move on to our second panel. Do you notice anything on this committee that everything is sort of back, uh, is reversed from every other committee I've ever had? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, oh, okay. It, it's, we were actually up here teasing a little bit that each committee seems to have its own little idiosyncrasies on how people are introduced, who sits on what sides, and it, I just, it, you know, I guess it is the tradition of how each committee um, grows up. Okay, we're about to begin the um, second panel. I'm sure you all heard the discussion. I think actually almost everyone here has testified before. You know, green start, yellow go faster. You know, red um, will let you sort of fini finish your thought. Um, you, know, the, um, you know, the first witness in our second panel will be Mark Friedman, the Executive Director of Labor Law Policy at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. He primarily focuses on workplace and employment regulatory issues. Before coming to the chamber more than eight years ago, Mr. Friedman was the regulatory counsel for the Senate Small Business Committee and examined agency compliance with the Regulatory Flexibility Act. Welcome. Um, is it tradition just to do one at a time? All right. Your five minutes begins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Chairman Swickard and 
Ranking Member Clark. Uh, thank you for inviting me to testify this morning on the value of the Regulatory Flexibility Act and the regulatory process. This morning I would like to focus my remarks on examples where OSHA and other Department of Labor agencies under the current administration did not take advantage of the RFA and SBREFA in their rulemakings. And note that I said did not take advantage. Compliance with the Regulatory Flexibility Act enhances the rulemaking process, assuming that the goal is to produce regulations that will have the maximum beneficial impact with a minimal burdensome impact. The key is that the RFA and SBREFA create channels for input from small entities that will be affected by the proposed regulations. When agencies seek this input and respect those small entities that will be subject to the regulation, all parties come out ahead. <coughs> As we have heard from Dr. Sargent, the RFA requires agencies to assess impacts on regulations on small entities and investigate less burdensome alternatives. And in the case of OSHA, EPA and now the CFPB, conduct uh, small business review panels unless the agency can certify that the regulation will not have a significant economic impact on a substantial number of small entities. For those agencies not required to conduct small business panels, the RFA's affirmative outreach requirement applies. Specifically, Section 609A directs agencies to assure that small entities have been given an opportunity to participate in the rulemaking. The timing of the small business input is an important feature of this process. Proposed regulations are not like proposed legislation, which can be very fluid and undergo many changes before being enacted. When an agency proposes a regulation, they are not saying, well, let's have a conversation about this issue. They are saying, this is what we intend to put in effect unless there is some very good reason we have overlooked why we cannot. By getting direct feedback about how a regulation will affect those covered by it, the agency can make changes before the proposal is issued. There is one more important point I want to make about the impact of the RFA. It does not force an agency to change their rulemaking, nor does it authorize the SBA Office of Advocacy to change or block an agency's rulemaking, even if the agency is ignoring advocacy's advice. The RFA merely sets out a process. It does not specify the outcome. Unfortunately, OSHA under this administration has displayed a certain resistance to taking advantage of the SBREFA process. In several rulemakings, OSHA could have clearly benefited if they had been willing to use the small business panel review process that the Act lays out. One of OSHA's first rulemakings under this administration sought to reinforce their intention to pursue enforcement even for those employers who are truly doing the right thing by asking for help from OSHA in identifying hazards in their workplace. As this rulemaking explicitly and exclusively deals with small businesses, OSHA would have benefited from hearing directly about their views on it. <coughs> Had they done so, they would have heard that small businesses would be less comfortable entering into the consultation program if this rulemaking is completed. Getting that message with that clarity at that time might have steered OSHA away from proposing this regulation. Another rulemaking where OSHA suffered for not conducting a small business panel is the high-profile rulemaking to add a column to the OSHA 300 record-keeping log to track musculoskeletal disorders, MSDs, the injuries associated with ergonomics. In January 2011, OSHA withdrew the final regulation from the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs to get input directly from small businesses. The agency conducted three teleconferences with small businesses to hear directly from them about their concerns with this rulemaking, exactly what would have happened if the agency had conducted the small business panel at the outset. If OSHA had taken advantage of the SBREFA procedures, this regulation might very well be in place by now. <coughs> Uh, similarly, other DOL agencies besides OSHA have avoided the RFA by tremendously under underestimating costs. Most notably, the Office of Labor Management Standards in their Persuader rulemaking and the Employment Training Administration in its H-2B program rulemaking. Time does not permit me to discuss these in detail, but they are covered in full in my statement. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this hearing this morning. I will be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Friedman. Our next witness is Carl Harris. Mr. Harris is the co-founder of Carl Harris & Company, a small specialty contracting firm in Wichita, Kansas. I have family in Derby. Excellent. That erects structural steel and precast concrete for residential and commercial buildings. He is testifying on behalf of the National Association of Home Builders. Welcome. You have five minutes. Begin. Good morning. Chairman Swikert, Ranking Member Clark, and distinguished members of the committee, my name is Carl Harris. I'm co-founder of the Carl Harris Company. Um, we're based out of Wichita. We have about 20 employees. I'm also a member of the National Association of Home Builders, NAHB, and president of the Kansas Building Industry Association. 
Thank you for the opportunity to be here today to talk about the impact of regulations on small home builders. As a small businessman operating in a heavily regulated industry, I understand how difficult it can be for a small builder to operate a successful, thriving business that provides the highest level of health, safety, and welfare for its employees. The sheer volume of regulations isn't the only problem. Often regulations are crafted without respect to the size of the regulated entities. Congress appropriately acknowledged this unique burden when in 1980 it passed the Regulatory Flexibility Act, the RFA, and subsequently amended it to include the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Fairness Act, or SBREFA. With the RFA, Congress intended for regulations to be crafted to the scale of the businesses while achieving the goals of the rule. This was an admirable aim. However, in practice, it does not appear to be working as intended. I have had the fortune of representing the residential construction industry in a number of small business review panels over the years. I have seen firsthand how agencies treat the RFA process as nothing more than a procedural check-the-box exercise and, worse still, artfully avoid complying with certain parts altogether. For example, in 2008, OSHA proposed the Cranes and Derricks Rule, which was intended to protect workers from the hazards associated with hoisting equipment in construction. For the development of this rule, OSHA relied on the negotiated rulemaking program. I participated as a small entity uh, representative, a SIR, on the review panel that followed. Several SIRs, myself included, raised concerns about the feasibility of various aspects of the rule, which was clearly designed for large commercial construction applications. I personally put forward an effective common sense alternative that would save lives and keep low the cost of compliance for small entities. Unfortunately, it seems my feedback fell on deaf ears. The problem was that it wasn't until after the negotiated rulemaking process was complete that OSHA convened the Small Business Advocacy Review Panel. So by the time we were brought in, the rule had already been determined, and not surprisingly, OSHA was not inclined to modify it based on the panel. Had small business been consulted earlier in the process, perhaps OSHA could have developed a more workable rule for small entities, thereby reducing the costs and the burdens associated with compliance. And as it was, the process seemed little more than a procedural hurdle, with little interest from OSHA to make changes based on the feedback received. Other times, small business representatives are left in the dark, brought in with insufficient information to allow us to evaluate regulatory options and provide alternatives. This was the case in 2010 when I participated in a small entity review panel that looked at a proposed Federal regulation covering stormwater discharges from developed sites. EPA, in preparation for the panel, failed to provide sufficient detailed information about the upcoming rule. As a result, we had no way to estimate the compliance costs or provide meaningful feedback um, to reduce the regulatory burden on small businesses. Several SIRs provided written comment to the effect and suggested that the agency's failure to provide sufficient information was a violation of SBREFA. When agencies are unprepared to provide small entity review panelists with the information and data necessary to evaluate the cost and compliance obligations, the process breaks down. Not only do participants like myself question the value of their participation, but the entire regulatory program loses its legitimacy and clearly undermines Congress's intent. These are just a couple of, an of examples that illustrate the need for improving the way agencies conduct the required reviews of proposed regulations under RFA. Doing so would result in far more efficient regulations and reduce compliance costs for our small businesses. As Congress looks for ways to improve agency compliance with RFA, we look forward to working with legislators on the most effective ways to help America's small businesses. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Uh, Ms. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have the uh, honor and privilege of uh, introducing Ms. Raina Steinzor. She is a professor of law at the University of Maryland's Francis Key Carey School of Law. She has taught cost courses in administrative law and written extensively in the area of Federal regulatory policy, particularly in regard to health, safety, and the environmental regulation. 
She is also the president of the Center for Progressive Reform, which is a nationwide network of scholars that focuses on Federal regulatory matters. Prior to her academic career, she was a partner in the Washington, D.C. law firm of Spiegel and McDonald, which counseled Federal, State and municipal clients on regulatory compliance. We would like to welcome you this morning and hear from you at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, giving me the opportunity to testify today. I could not agree more with the subcommittee's overarching mission, strengthening the role of small business in repairing an economy ruined by deregulated, too-big-to-fail financial institutions. Big business uses small business as a kind of human shield conflating the two sectors' distinctly different needs and pushing for deregulation that could further endanger the economy and public health. A case in point is the SBA Office of Advocacy, which has consciously diverted its limited taxpayer-funded resources from helping small business toward pursuing the complaint du jour of the very large companies that call the shots at the American Chemistry Council, the National Association of Manufacturers, and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. These activities raise the disturbing prospect that the Office of Advocacy has broken the law. In fact, I hope that the evidence I put before you today will motivate you to ask the GAO to investigate whether the Office of Advocacy has complied with laws that bar federally funded agencies from lobbying and require it to conduct its affairs in the sunshine. From what we can tell, the Office routinely intervenes in rulemakings with only tangential effects on its constituency, al allowing Fortune 500 companies to set its agenda, do its research, and provide the substance of its comments. Consider, for example, a series of emails exchanged between Kevin Bromberg of the Office of Advocacy and David Fisher of the American Chemistry Council. The two were discussing an aggressive lobbying campaign that large chemical manufacturers had mounted against the National Toxicology Program's proposal to declare formaldehyde as a known carcinogen. This is a scientific finding, not a regulation, but formaldehyde's manufacturers were adamant. Fisher wrote, I suspect the delay in the assessment will not get to the press because it has been delayed already for months so any further delay would be a non-issue. Bromberg responded, it is probably better for now that I keep the National Toxicology Program contact in the dark. Such skullduggery not only provides assistance to Fisher's multibillion dollar clients at the taxpayer's expense, it violates the fundamental principle that the Office of Advocacy should work within the government to find better ways for small businesses its only legitimate constituency, to comply with the regulations the same government is writing. Between 2005 and 2012, the American Chemistry Council and its members spent over $333 million lobbying Congress and Federal agencies. The last thing these giants need is a taxpayer subsidy. As for violations of sunshine laws, the Office of Advocacy hosts, hosts regular environmental roundtables that feature presentations by lobbyists and lawyers for Fortune 500 companies. They occur behind closed doors, and their agendas, attendance lists, and minutes are not published. Nevertheless, the roundtables result in positions that are adopted as policy by the Office. Two weeks ago, a senior scientist from the Environmental Defense Fund attempted to participate in a roundtable, but he was told that he could listen to the discussion but not speak. The roundtable consisted of presentations by Nancy Beck, a former White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs staffer who now works for the American Chemistry Council, and Robert Fensterheim, a former American Petroleum Institute staffer who now works at the Red Net IRIS Forum, an industry group dedicated to undermining EPA's integrated risk information system. Self-righteous crusaders against regulation have, becoming, have become accustomed 
to telling only half the story to the American people. They pretend that exaggerated regulatory costs are the only result of the system and ignore its considerable benefits. Conversely, they suggest that if we dismantled the regulatory system, we would suffer no negative consequences and instead reap a windfall and save money. My testimony furnishes additional detailed information about the benefits of regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now um, some, a handful of questions. Mr. Friedman, uh, now you were with the uh, Senate Small Business for how many years? Uh, just uh, over five years. In that time, because you probably sat through a, a number of these hearings, and um, uh, if you right now were looking for bottlenecks in the law that would actually help both an advocacy for small business but also uh, a mechanism for dealing with rule sets that are coming and trying to find what's rational, you know, both from a cost and benefit standpoint, but also from an economic modeling standpoint. Okay, where do you see the bottleneck? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think I look at it this way. The critical part of the Regulatory Flexibility Act process is the go-no-go -go, uh, decision that uh, focuses on the significant economic impact on substantial number of small entities. And agencies have the flexibility to define those key terms as they wish significant economic impact and substantial number of small entities. And agencies will go all over the map, even within their own uh, agency between rulemakings, they will define things differently. And I think what might be helpful here is some type of consistency or at least some type of guidance to the agencies to say this is how we think you should define things or these are the factors you should take into effect. And if I can just finish that point. Um, Dr. Sargent raised some of the things I think could be helpful. For instance, the, the inclusion of indirect impacts. Um, there has been some legislation offered previously on this point. My thought is it would be helpful to be specific about what kind of indirect impacts uh, should be included. So, for instance, in the EPA world, um, states implement a lot of the requirements that the EPA lays out. The fact that the states implement those requirements is lost in the context of an indirect impact. So if that's the case, that should be brought into the discussion and those impacts should be captured going towards the question of a significant economic impact. Would you, <coughs> Mr. Friedman, would you go as far as um, trying to create a better box on how you define um, cost benefit, how you define, I mean, uh, economic impact? Because in our office over the last couple of months, we've tried to collect some right. m mechanisms from different agencies. And I find, you know, sometimes they have very, you know, some it's almost anecdotal. Yeah. Tell me a story. And others, it's we want to do math. And cost benefit is a term that many people use. It, it frequently comes up in the context of the regulatory process and regulations. Um, it's a very hard concept to, to nail down. Uh, I'm not going to try and sit here and tell you that Congress, in its wisdom, can tell you exactly what a cost benefit is. I, I never use the word wisdom and Congress <laughs> in the same sentence. Fair enough. Um, it, it, it's a tough subject, and I think the, what might be helpful is to try and steer the agencies uh, either through legislation or, uh, as Dr. Sargent was describing, the training process uh, embedded in the Executive Order 13272 mm -hmm. to help agencies get to this point of appreciating the impact and recognizing their, uh, the goal of, of trying to capture it and be honest about it. Uh, I think part of the discussion here is attitudinal. Uh, agencies take a position, they want to do a reg, you know, we've seen it time and again, and they don't want, you know, somebody else telling them how to do it. And, and somehow, and I don't know the silver bullet here, that attitude needs to, needs to change. And, and I think the 13272 process is, is, is very helpful with that and, and a good start, but it really has to keep reinforcing it, particularly now that we're coming into the second term of administration, people change, new people are in place. You have to keep reinforcing well, that but, type but, of but approach. In some ways, you know, for some of us, it's just sort of the standard of practice. You know, so we sort of, you know, whether I agree with you or disagree with you, at least I understand how you got there and, and I know what I'm objecting to Let me or, make one, or, or agreeing to. Let me make one more quick point, and, and this is in my, my full statement. The problems with the uh, Agency Compliance with the Regulatory Flexibility Act and SBRIFA stretch back over several administrations. And this really is not a specifically Republican or Democrat example, 
we've seen it. Well, the fr what, framework ways. comes from late Carter administration. That's correct. So, mm -hmm. right. But I mean, yeah, we've seen a examples of agencies that that didn't take these issues seriously in, in several different administrations and different parties. Okay, M Mr. Harris, um, you know, welcome from you know beautiful Thanks. Wichita. You have a lot of snow. Not anymore. It was 60 degrees there yesterday. Okay, good. And I came to this because my wife's going to make me. <laughs> yeah, my wife's going to make me visit the relatives. And when you're from Scottsdale, there you go. We don't go when there's snow. <laughs> Um, and th this is sort of a one-off, but I've been trying to get my head around a, a briefing I had yesterday. Um, do you do much concrete cutting? Uh, yes, I do. Um, are you familiar there may be an um, EPA rule set out there where even the dust you create from the concrete cutting Silica. may be? I, I, I'm, yeah, I, both both well, OSHA I'm, and EPA in regard okay, to Okay, I'm, I'm walking through because I grew up in a, a construction family, so... Sanding down drywall, cutting concrete, sand, I mean, how many different elements on there? I mean, even down to the sandpaper you use, what would... Those are the, um, as I understand, the, the drywall in regard to silica, um, there's not silica in drywall cement, but um, in the areas that we do precast concrete, when footings and foundations aren't done correctly, then remediation has to be done. We understand and um, um, we train for that at our local builders association, how we should protect our workers in regard to that. Um, we have tried to work closely with, with OSHA and the silica standard and how would be the best practices to deal with that and what might trigger those things. But, yeah, we, j we just got to get in. We got to get small business involved in the regulatory process as early as possible because we truly are the experts in the field. I mean, you see a cloud of dust, you may see danger. We see that all the time. We just need to tell you what we do and how we can do it better and safer as opposed to have that come from outside. Okay. Um, all right. Well, with that, Ms. Clark. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, my first question is to Professor Steinzor. Um, Mr. Harris, in his testimony, stated that his organization believes that, quote, the RFA should be amended to include judicial review of the panel requirements to ensure agencies adhere to the law, end quote. What are your thoughts on that proposal? There is a longstanding doctrine in administrative law that doesn't um, bring you to court until an agency has issued a final agency action. And as I understand the way this would work, you would be allowed to take the agency into court mid-rulemaking. And this would cause a lot of extra delay, which also has costs. I mean, we forget that so often that the longer it takes to promulgate a rule, the more people are exposed to whatever the harm the rule is trying to address. So there are costs on both sides, and I would urge you to be cautious about that kind of approach. The, the, so, so we're trying to weigh costs and costs, essentially, uh, for the small business, um, the uh, idea that a particular rule could mean that uh, them being able to really be effective in whatever work it is that they're, they're um, the rule is going to be applying to um, is a challenge for that company. On the other hand, the rule uh, is being uh, uh, promulgated because there's a particular harm that uh, an agency may be trying to address that can cost um, as well. And so uh, the time factor there uh, becomes uh, the challenge on, on both sides. I could not agree more. You've put it beautifully. Um, I would only say that I completely favor finding ways to make regulations more tolerable for small businesses. Um, but if workers get sick, they can't come to work, and that is also a very costly problem. Um, and some of the regulations, especially ones that the Office of Advocacy has been focusing on, 
are so um, large that they're really not um, aimed at small business at all. Mm. I mean, some of EPA's air pollution rules, as I say in my testimony, would save millions of lost days at work, which can only help small businesses because people won't have cardiac problems, they won't have asthma attacks, et cetera. Very well. Help the economy. Very well, very well. Um, uh, the second question uh, is, is to you again, uh, Professor Steinzer. The Crane and Crane study has been widely cited for its estimates of the regulatory burden facing small businesses. What is your opinion of the study, and do you believe that it is credibly in, credible enough to be relied on by, by this committee? Um, no, I do not believe that it has any credibility. It has been dismantled by our organization, the Economic Policy Institute, the Congressional Research Service, uh, the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. Anybody who has looked at it um, cannot replicate the results. And the Economic Policy Institute in particular got the data and tried to reverse en engineer the calculations and was unable to even come close. One of the aspects in that study is uh, a poll that was taken, a survey of business leaders around the world, and the World Bank, which uh, conducted the, the survey, uh, said it shouldn't be used in that way. So I'd urge you not to. There are better, better thing, analyses. Very well. And let me just uh, Mr. Chairman, if you indulge me, have one final question for Mr. Friedman. Uh, in your discussion of OSHA's GHS rule, you state that the agency loaded it up, uh, that's your quote, uh, with other provisions that didn't make sense for small businesses, but that do increase safeguards for the workers, which is actually OSHA's mission. Um, would you uh, care to clarify or uh, or is it your view that OSHA should give small businesses views priorities over workers when it develops its regulations? Thank you, Congressman Clark. Um, it is my view that OSHA should follow the regulatory process and make sure that anything that is in the final rule was proposed first and that terms in their regulations are clear and understandable by small businesses and are not open traps for small businesses uh, so that OSHA has an opportunity to just come in and enforce without the small businesses knowing what they have to comply with. Um, it is also my view that if OSHA is going to insert a uh, hazard into a regulation that everyone understands the definition of that hazard and that it is not an open-ended, as I said, trap for small businesses. Um, these things can be done in the, in the name of protecting employees and in the name of giving small businesses a fair chance to understand the regulation. So just, to, just as a follow-up, and I am going to close here, I am just trying to, if, if, if I am a regulatory agency and my, my main function is to make sure that workers are protected, you are saying that there needs to be an overlay or a view that looks at small business in the context of protecting workers? I am trying to figure out if I were an, an agency person and I am concerned about the health and well-being of the employees, you know, uh, how you balance out um, well, th 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 those concerns in terms of uh, how you view it, how, you know, because the, their goal is not to necessarily um, uh, be concerned about the business as much as it is the employees of the business. So, you know, how would you sort of reconcile that? Well, if I may, Congresswoman, I would ask you to think about this in the context of the business person trying to figure this out. Uh, if OSHA puts in a requirement that is an open ended requirement that they will not know whether they have satisfied and it is just a trap for enforcement, how does that serve anybody's good? How does that serve anybody's goals? Um, it, it, what we're looking here for in the term, in the context of OSHA regulations, is clarity and well-supported regulations. Uh, the the more OSHA focuses on those models, the better the outcome will be. The
the more employers and small businesses will know what they are required to do, the more they can protect their employees. If you just throw out a, a hazard that is not defined, and, and the one in the discussion here is combustible dust, um, then what is an employer to do? If they don't know what that means. There is no definition of that. You can't expect an employer to protect against something they don't know how to understand. That is just not, it's not fair. It doesn't get to the, to the end goal. So, you know, I understand your concern from the, from the agency's perspective, but the agency needs to operate within certain parameters, and that is the focal point of the regulatory process. Okay. We want to just drill in a little bit more on this. How do you uh, define open traps? Um, do you believe that OSHA is uh, a rogue agency just looking to entrap uh, and punish small business? No. I have never described OSHA as a rogue agency. Okay. Um, I think in the current administration they have placed a, a very explicit emphasis on enforcement. Uh, I think some of their regulatory approaches have gone towards the idea of increasing their opportunity for enforcement. As I mentioned uh, in the discussion about the cooperative agreements rulemaking, that was about telling uh, small businesses that they were going to be subject to enforcement even though they are bringing OSHA in, asking for help in identifying hazards. Um, in the context of the GHS regulation that we are discussing here, uh, they included a provision called hazards not otherwise classified. That is an open-ended concept. Mm -hmm. It means that an employer will not be able to tell when they have satisfied all the hazards that OSHA may have in mind. Uh, that is what I mean when I talk about traps. That is what I mean when I talk about OSHA putting in provisions that are geared towards enforcement more than they are towards safety. So the whole idea of clarity and definition is what ultimately um, makes it a, a hospitable business in environment. It, it will certainly aid in increasing compliance and therefore adding to workplace safety. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Friedman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Uh, Mr. Bentivoglio. And am I getting close from pronouncing it right? You did it perfect. Mm. Wow. Bentivoglio, you got to sing it when you say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you never want me trying to be musical. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Harris, um, uh, you know, I'm trying to, sitting here formulating what it's like to be a contractor. Single family homes, multi, uh, like apartments? Single family, multifamily, Both? small commercial, shopping, small shopping centers, right. school additions, whatever I can do to make a living. I understand. <laughs> Nothing like the smell of fresh excavated dirt. Agreed. Right? The sound of concrete coming down a chute, right? And then you have the carpenters, fresh cut lumber, circular saws, a symphony in construction. Right. It smells like an economy growing. I have, yeah, yeah, I do, I guess. And you know, each one of those uh, different facets of construction is a contractor or subcontractor Agreed. working for you. Now, are you responsible for that uh, subcontractor following regulations? And what is the procedure you go through? If so, to for, to ensure that they comply uh, with these regulations, so you won't be shut down. Um, first of all, I must uh, let you know that I am an OSHA outreach trainer for a satellite training facility, which is located in our our local home builders association. As we reach out um, to other small businesses to make sure that they have the inf information and training. Um, each subcontractor is responsible um, for their own health and safety. I'm responsible for the culture of safety and health on that project. Um, OSHA kind of recognizes that in what they call their mo uh, multi-employer work site um, rules. We haven't seen a lot of enforcement in regard you know, that go up the chain, but we try to um, put forth the culture of safety, health and welfare on every job site. And filtered down to our subcontractors. We realize through the help of the National Association of Home Builders and, um, and our local builders association that their training is what, is what the needs are. And if, if I could kind of answer um, um, Congressman uh, Clark's question, 
if we have reasonable um, regulations, we have higher participation and compliance. So actually we could save more lives with more reasonable um, regulation than if we have a hard and fast regulation um, that, that everybody's going to ignore because it doesn't make any sense. And so that's where we think with, with enough <coughs> early information, a chance to work in the process, which is what this does, um, we have a better chance of getting sound um, regulation that works on the job site. That's terrific. As a small business owner trying to do your best to comply with EPA and OSHA rules, what is your greatest fear in dealing with those agencies? Surprises. A businessman can't have surprises. Uh, I don't have the time to constantly monitor um, the, the Federal Register to see what's going down. We rely on our trade associations um, to help us find out what those information uh, is out there. We, no business likes surprises. We are planning for the future. We are estimating projects out there. We really want to work um, to that betterment and work within, within all the regulations that are out there. Surprises are what we can't handle. If we have an opportunity to work with, with um, clarity on the development of these regulations, then we can let our members know, we can let my friends know, and um, we can all work within the rules. Thank you very much. Mr. Harris, I yield back my time. Thank you. Um, and with that, thank, thank you. I did have a, just, just a couple uh, odds and ends. And, Mr. Freeman, I, one more time. If, if I have the good doctor come and sit down in my office and we start to flow chart, you know, sort of how his process works, and some of this is as much making sure that you know, the law is up to date for how we're passing information today. Um, what would you inject into that conversation? You mean with respect to how advocacy functions and, and well, well, the process? Well, and, how we're doing, and how we're doing today, because I'm still trying to get my head around saying, okay, I have a few thousand rule sets right, that affect right. small business. Are they capturing and are they focusing on what's rational to focus on for small business? Right. Well, th um, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm going to take the advantage, uh, take the opportunity to your question to respond to something that Professor Stenzer um, mentioned, and that is uh, her criticism of the idea of bringing in a provision that would allow small businesses to challenge an agency certification mid-rule. Um, and, and she's certainly correct that agency actions have to be final before they can go to court. The value of, first of all, what you could do is to describe that agency certification as a final action, therefore making it subject to judicial review. And the, the point here is to preserve the timing of the small business input in the process so that you don't have to wait several years until the rule goes final and everything, everything is baked in the cake at that point to then say, well, way back then the agency did a bad certification and therefore they should be challenged. The point is to be able to challenge the agency action at the time when it's still relevant to the process. And, and so the idea of creating an opportunity, and it could be written in a way that would be very narrow, very t time sensitive, uh, and would not disrupt the process in any tremendous way. But it's important that that decision gets attention at the time that it's made so that the input from small businesses can be brought into the process at the time it's most important. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Um, but that's, that's partially where I was trying to go, is a, a true understanding of the sort of the flow chart, the mechanics, right. and, and when, when triggers are hit. Um, because we had the good doctor before saying, you know, there are certain things he wish he had 60 days. That's it within the three for process yeah. concept, right. And, and I think his point was well taken. Um, part of the discussion in the brief panel process is that you are talking with people who are out there making a living, like Mr. Harris, who are not regulatory specialists. And you are asking them to look at a proposed regulation with supporting analyses and understand it in the context of this discussion. And that's, that's just not what they do for a living. Uh, that, that's not even easy for me. Uh, and so it, giving them some more time to come up to speed on that discussion, I think, would, would help their participation in the process. And Mr. Harris has been in those panels himself, so he can probably tell you more about what would be helpful in that regard. M Ms. Steinzer. Um, is my little fixation on just understanding the linearity, if that's a word, of the process appropriate? Uh, 
I think it is very appropriate. And I would suggest to you that what you may want to pursue with Dr. Sargent is exactly the question that you keep asking. How are these rulemakings selected? We only know what we could get from a Freedom of Information Act request to the Office of Advocacy. And what the information that we got back from that shows that the Office is in touch with a lot of large company lobbyists, and that is how it makes its choices. And that when it takes a position, it doesn't ask well, anybody well, well, in Ms. small Smith, business. Because I actually even read um, the, the advocacy piece. And right. The, the, to say that that is how they make their decisions, I don't think there is any actuarial data that says that. But they get the information. We will give you that. But, but to actually say one is one, I think that is there is not data that says that. I would love to know if they do any surveys of small businesses to identify what rules are the most problem, if they make those a priority, if they are even in touch with small businesses okay. that have problems. And, and the, the question part is fine. It is rational to right. say one is the cause of the effect. I, I always be very careful of sort of anecdotal leaps. So, uh, Mr. Harris, you get the last word, and then we are all running off to our, our next panels that we are all supposed to be on. What would be wrong, and again, just a country boy asking, what would be wrong with assuming that small business is affected with every regulation and then go from there and make them prove that they are not, as opposed to you have to prove that they are affected significantly and with enough numbers? So, I mean, almost that it's, it works out being like the, the Miranda of regulation. You can't do anything till you do this. Why is it always the country boy gets the best line at the end of the meet? You, you get together? It, it, it's, it often works that way. Um, all set? All right. Hey, I, I want to thank the witnesses today. Thank you. Um, you know, for, for much of this, this is also the education of a new member like myself on the committee. And I've been trying to read everything I can get my hands on. And this is actually for my brothers and sisters on the panel and anyone else in the room. I'll read anything. Mm -hmm. um, I'm fairly voracious. Send it our way. And when agencies fail to you know, actually comply with the Regulatory Flexibility Act, let's face it, our economy suffers, our economic growth suffers, and our job creation suffers. Um, the committee will continue to exercise our oversight responsibilities to ensure that Federal agencies comply with the RFA Act. And we will consider ways to strengthen this important statute and make sure it is also relative to today and not basically 30 plus years ago when it was originally drafted. And I ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit written statements and supporting materials for the record. Hearing no objection, one day someone's going to object and just I'm going to have no idea what to do. <laughs> And with that so ordered, the panel is adjourned.